So good morning, and, and uh, we are back to the book On the Way to the Light. Let me share here uh, the screen. Um, last month, when we were studying uh, this book, we spoke at length about the, the French Revolution. Uh, we spoke the, the reasons that led to the French Revolution, what was going on in, in France in the 18th century, which is the first item that we read. Uh, the, the struggles uh, with food, with famine, uh, the origins of the ideas that generated the revolution that came from the encyclopedists that created the first encyclopedia in the world. Uh, Louis XVI, the king at that time, his struggles with, uh, with the lack of uh, resources that uh, his, uh, his predecessor, Louis XV, spent a lot. Um, so the absolutism, the French absolutism was crumbling and that a lot of things generated the, the French Revolution. When we had the French Revolution, uh, we just had, we started very beginning, we gave all the historical facts to, that led to it. Uh, today, we continue studying the French Revolution, but uh, I'll try to, to bring a little bit of the spiritual side of it, because the facts, we're, we're going to cover the facts, and uh, we are going to talk a little bit about uh, the, the political aspects and the social aspects that, that uh, play the role in, uh, in the French Revolution. But um, let's also try to bring a little bit of, uh, of spirituality of what was uh, happening uh, on the other side, on the spiritual side of it, uh, to compare you know, the, 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 what uh, the spiritual world wanted and what, uh, what was really achieved, uh, of course, through our free will, we deviate from the course and uh, that happened a lot in the, of course, in the French Revolution with all the barbaric uh, actions that uh, took place uh, during it, okay? So um, we, we read the first one. We are going to start here on this, the time of darkness. Um, so, right, they will read for us today? Yes, of course. Philip had, the, had double duty on Thursday. So, <laughs> I we give him a break. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay. The time of darkness. Bastille was stormed on July 14, 1789. And after the famous declaration of the rights of man and the citizen, there was a series of reforms in every area of French and South social tweet and political life. Such revelations, renovations, however, were merely a prelude to the most glorious events. Numerous families took advantage of the truce to seek asylum in neighboring countries. And Louis himself tried to cross the border, but was arrested in Baroness and taken back to Paris. A rim of darkness was invading the consciences of benevolent France called at that time by the spirit plane to fulfill a sacred mission for suffering humankind. All it would have to do would be to take advantage of what the English had accomplished by breaking the scepter of royal absolutism and organize a new administrative process in the renewal of political organisms of the orb in accordance with the wise teachings of his philosophers and thinkers. Nevertheless, if there were a few spirits who had been prepared for the heroic journey at the end of that century, there were many others, unfortunately, who looked in the darkness of the psychological moment to satiate their thirst for blood and power. Thus, after the many noteworthy fe features of the first revolutionaries, wicked spirits such as Robespierre and Mara appeared on the scene the elation of victory fostered a widespread murderous rapture in the spirit of the masses, which led to the most nefarious events. Okay, so um, 
what we, we, we mentioned uh, last month that uh, the Bastille that was formed on July 14, 1789, that is uh, commemorated until today uh, as the birth date of the French Revolution. And the Bastille was a famous prison that act in, uh, actually had very few prisoners at that time, as we mentioned, uh, seven or eight only, mm -hmm. but it was heavily guarded. It was considered a symbol of the monarchy. So the, the storm of the Bastille was uh, really the, 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 the fact that uh, started the French Revolution, uh, according to historians. But, um, you know, in, in, in practice, terms uh, it had uh, the, the act itself had very little influence in the revolution. The revolution was going to happen without the Bastille being stormed or not. Um, the famous Declaration of Rights of Man and the Citizen is a very important document. And uh, this declaration was originally uh, drafted by the Marquis de Lafayette. And uh, this is an important name, the Marquis de Lafayette was an, a name in the revolution, in the French Revolution. But uh, before that, he, he was a very important part in the war of independence of the United States. He came here and uh, he led the French um, army that helped uh, the, the, the Americans to fight against the, uh, the British here and uh, became a very important part of the independence of this country. And then he went back to, to France and uh, was part of the government. And uh, especially in the beginning, and of course, after he was, you know, he, he, he was cast aside by the, the, the hard uh, core revolutionaries, but he was not executed and he ended up uh, coming back to the government in the time of Napoleon and then back and forth. But uh, the important thing is that this declaration that he drafted, he drafted in consultation with Thomas Jefferson. So a lot of what you see here, it's also part of what you see in the, in the constitution of the US. The doctrine of the natural rights, the rights of men that are held to be universal valid at all times and every place. So if you analyze that comparing to the Declaration of Independence of this country, uh, actually the, the Declaration of, of uh, Rights of Man and the Citizen was something that was a little bit more forward thinking than the Declaration of Independence in this country that uh, was really built for uh, the time and the place that uh, the independence uh, was achieved. Uh, and then you have the, the amendments here. You have the famous amendments of the constitution that adapted the constitution to the times. The Declaration of Rights and, of Man and Citizen, if you read it today, um, it's still the basis for the, the notion of free individuals pro protected equally by the law. It's supposed to be universal means, supposed to be valid at all times and all places. It, it's still included in the constitutions of the Fourth French Republic in 1946 and the Fifth Republic in 1958, and it's still used. Uh, it was inspired by Enlightenment philosophers. Uh, it was a it, it was a, it had a major impact on the development of the concepts of individual liberty and democracy in the in Europe and worldwide. Uh, so, uh, the, if you if you if you think about the 1948 United Nations the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is what uh, the basis for the rights of of all, all humanity, it was inspired. Uh, on this declaration of, uh, of uh, rights of men and citizen, plus the English Bill of Rights of 1689, the 1215 Magna Carta that we studied before, the Declaration of Independence of the United States in 1776, and the United States Bills of Rights in 1789. So you see 
how important really this uh, Declaration of Rights of Man and Citizen was. And of course, this is all inspired by the work of spirits that guide us humanity uh, to, to be uh, progressive in terms of rights. Uh, because at that time, if you think of uh, France before that time, the only ones that had any rights were the church and uh, the monarchy. It was an absolute absolute monarchy. The king and uh, the court has all the rights. The church also, which, you know, when you talk before the revolution, the monarchy and the church is one and only. You, you know, you couldn't be French without being Catholic. So it was not, uh, uh, there was no separation between the government, the church, and the people there. People would have to follow it uh, completely. So uh, the, when this time the revolution comes, the first thing that the revolution does is to, to give rights to the common citizen. Uh, of course, again, we're not talking here about universal rights. That was the idea. In practice, it's, you know, it doesn't uh, happen that way. And we see here in the, this country, right? It took another hundred years for the slaves to be freed. So the universal rights of, of, the, of people here didn't apply to the whole population, apply to the free citizens, let's say. But in France, the, the, this uh, declaration of, uh, of the rights of men, uh, it was the, the very basis of, of the abolishment of, of slavery that uh, it, because it brought it in it the ideas of, of uh, freedom, of women's rights, even talk about uh, homosexuality, believe it or not. Um, so the protection uh, of people to go to courts, uh, the property, the protection of property, uh, the, the separation of powers. So all these things are, are created with this famous declaration. Uh, unfortunately, of course, you always have abuses. So the idea here, um, because the France was really the center of um, of the world in, term, in terms of a nation, progressive nation, the ideas and the people that, uh, the spirits that were incarnating in France at that time were spirits that uh, had the mission to bring civilization forward. Uh, the French Revolution ended completely feudalism. The feudal, feudal system ended with the French Revolution. Uh, all the other, uh, all the other things that were still part of the absolutism that uh, happened in uh, in Europe since the Dark Ages uh, were part of this uh, break that the French Revolution brought. Okay, so it was it has. On one hand, it had a lot of advances. On the other hand, what happens is that you have, every time you have a big um, change, thinking forward, you have a very strong resistance. And you don't need to be very, go very far to see this happening nowadays around us. Um, and the resistance came internally and came from the other countries around uh, France, right? Because, for instance, uh, in in uh, in Britain, they had the monarchy; they still have it until today. So they were afraid that uh, this revolution would spread and threaten the monarchy in in Britain. So they didn't like it. Uh, the The ideas of freedom that uh, the revolution brought was already. Um, we studied that in, in Britain, it, it was already existed. The monarchy wasn't, uh, wasn't absolutist in, in, in Britain anymore. But you have small kingdoms in Germany, what is today Germany, it was divided in small kingdoms. 
that uh, had absolute power over the over their lands. What's called what called Pru Pru Russia. Austria also was absolutist. Uh, you have the church that dominated Italy and all the surroundings. That the church was very dominant and absolutist, also dominating all, uh, imposing their their beliefs. And uh, so this is this French Revolution is a threat to all of them. So that's why uh, wars against uh, the rest of Europe started uh, with the revolution and only ended after the, the defeat of Napoleon uh, in, uh, in, the, in the beginning of the, the 19th century, around 1815, I, I believe. But we're talking, going to talk about Napoleon late, later. So unfortunately, of course, when you have uh, these uh, Revolutions, you have uh, those that try to take advantage and that happened in France. And when he mentioned here Robespierre and Mahat, they, they were uh, two of the radicals that took over in the, uh, as, uh, in the continuation and, in, and uh, implant, implemented the, the, the reign of terror that we're going to see uh, later. But uh, before we move there, another thing that, uh, uh, appeared that uh, was created with the French Revolution. That it was. It's very interesting that many people, many people know, but many don't know the notions of political left and right appeared in the French Revolution, because in the assembly of the of of of, of, uh, of that time when the new assembly was um, was established. They divided uh, the, the the members sitting on the right were the were the, those that still defended the, the king and the monarchy, not an absolutist monarchy, but some form of monarchy. And on the left, uh, sit uh, the, it was the seat of those that wanted to overthrow the 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 uh, the monarchy and were more radical and want more radical changes. And in the middle, the center were the ones that were a little bit, uh, were not on one side or the other. Uh, so they wanted uh, to find a, a middle ground solution for the political problems. So from there, it, can, it comes the notion that is still used up to today of left and right in politics, left being those that uh, want more uh, interference of the government and uh, participation of the government. Uh, you know, you have the radical left and you have uh, less radicals up, up to the center and you have the right, which are the, the considered to be more uh, cons uh, uh, the, those that want to, to keep the, the establishment the way it is. They are more uh, resistant to, to changes and uh, are more, um, depending on the grad gradation, more uh, uh, defend more, less interference of the government but the original notions of left and right appeared at the French Revolution. That's where it all started. It was really the way they seated on the left and on the right in the, in the chamber, in the chamber of the assembly, National Assembly in France. Okay, comment questions here? Luis, have some? Well, uh, if you give me the chance, there are maybe three things I would like to, to add to your excellent explanation, by the way. Uh, one interesting thing, uh, uh, after last uh, reading of this book, I did some research and I, I learned things that I, don't rem I didn't remember. And we talked about the, the last paragraph that we read during the last reading, talked about the general states and that's interesting because uh, uh, French at that time had three states, the clergy, besides the king, of course, the clergy, the nobility, and everybody else. The rest. <laughs> the clergy was about half percent of the population. The nobility was about one and a half percent of the population. So 2% here and everybody else. And do you know who was taxed? Everybody, Everybody else. Yeah. So yeah. those guys were carrying the, uh, the nation, let's say, the, all, all the structure. And 
uh, uh, this is general state was the assembly of, of representatives of those uh, uh, three states of, of the French society. And like, you know, what would be a Congress today or something. Anyway, I found that interesting. Obviously, that is it's food for revolution, the economic side, especially in a country that was devastated by the spending of the monarch and the, uh, uh, the downing of the of the economy. But just this was just to explain the general states that I was curious about. And a lot of things happened there. And Lafayette was the guy who suggested the, the convocation. And there comes my second point. Remember, I have asked many times about you guys, uh, I have you asked you guys many times about the Masons, the Freemasons. Yeah. Uh, Lafayette was a Freemason. Mirabeau was a Freemason. Washington was a Freemason. So I wonder if many of those spirits that reincarnated, that incarnated that, at that period, if they weren't one way or the other gathered by the Freemason movement of the time to have a chance to, were inspired to do that. I have no references to this. It's just something I wonder. But it's easy to imagine that that could have happened, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. I agree with you. Um, you know, and I believe normally... Thomas Jefferson was a Freemason as well. Yeah. Anyway, and the third thing that I, uh, I, I, I like to point out, uh, liberté, qualité, fraternité. fraternité. Uh, freedom, equality, fraternity. How close to the spiritist ideas that is, isn't it? Yeah, but, and we are going to get there by the end of the, when we arrive at Napoleon, oh, I'm going to bring something to you guys so we can uh, read it together to see the, the, the participation of, uh, of the spirit, spirits in the spiritual world in, the, in, the, in all this, what happened at that time, but it was, Good that you brought the states because uh, I read about it. And interesting also is that you had three estates and each one had one vote. So, of course, all the time, the votes of the clergy and the nobility won against the one vote of the rest. Right. So uh, that was one, one problem that uh, the general states was creating uh, because the church at that time owned 10% of the land in France. Uh, and didn't pay a penny. Uh, everyone that lived there was paying. The, the, the nobility didn't pay anything in taxes. And the rest paid the what's called a teeth, which is 10% of, of, of their income. And uh, they barely had money to survive. They couldn't uh, survive and uh, pay taxes. And it's always the same, right? You see the time at the time of the Jesus, of Jesus, right? What the, the Israelis were fighting against, uh, the Jewish population was fighting against, Roman uh, and taxes, right? So it's always the same. We, we are fighting against the government charging too much. And, um, you know, in, in, a, in an ideal world, we would be happy paying taxes because the, the taxes would serve, would come back to us in benefits for us all, right? But in reality, we are so far from that. Uh, taxes are used for uh, any, a lot of things that uh, we really don't want them to be used for. And that, that's caused, and the government is always trying to charge more taxes because we always need money. And uh, we are always revolting against paying taxes. You know, today, tomorrow is the tax day here in this country, right, this year. So it's very appropriate that we are talking about taxes today, right? Nobody here is very happy to have to pay taxes tomorrow. <laughs> Dolly, it, it sure is hard to get a word in edgewise here. Uh, I just <laughs> want to say that anybody who's interested in the Freemasons, uh, Netflix has several uh, good programs um, uh, about Freemasons. I've watched them. They're really good. 
Okay. All right. Good to know. Um, any 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 one Python special that you remember? Any special? Um... They all use the, the term Freemason uh, in, in, the, in the title. title. Okay. Right. Yeah. Merlin, right. did you say Netflix? Yes. yes. Okay. Good. Good to know. Thanks, Marnie. All right. It's, it's Anyone just, else? There, there was an, another little thing. You know that sure. uh, series Netflix had about um, uh, dying? And, yeah. Uh, okay. Well, I read a lot. So I went uh, to the thrift store, thrift book, and I found Dr. Neal's book. She uh, uh, was a surgeon. She and her husband both. And the book, you know, offers so much more information than what we saw on TV. So All right. it's very inexpensive if you go to thrift bookstore or maybe even eBay. What What's the name name of the book again? It's called "To Heaven and Back: A Doctor's Extraordinary Account of Her Death, Heaven, Angels, and Life Again: A True Story." Mary okay. C. Neal, M.D. Thank you. Nice. Okay, good to know. And also, another uh, part of that uh, series was about um, the little boy um, yes. who was in the fight, who was a, in a plane and being shot down all the time. Yes. Well, I found his book also, and it's called Soul Survivor. And yeah, it's the reincarnation of a World War II fighter pilot. And again, this book is, it has just so much more depth and information. I know everybody would enjoy it. Yeah, she was actually, what's her name? I forgot her name. She was at one of our symposiums, the symposium five or six. She was uh, talking about this book. Uh, what's her name um, again? Which book are you talking about, Dr. Uh, the, 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 the one that of the reincarnation of the pilot, the boy, it was a pilot. Oh, Soul Survivor by Bruce and Andrea Leninger. Oh no, that this, okay. So the book is, is written by the, the, the parents. This book is by the parents, not the lady that uh, first, right. uh, she wrote a book. There was a book before that, that was wrote by a, I forgot her name, that she came to our symposium and talked about this case. His, his name is Leninger, I remember the boy. But uh, this book either. that you have is written, I think by, by the boy and the parents or something like that. It is. Yeah. Yeah. And they didn't want to believe it. Um, yeah. Originally, they had to, as all the evidence uh, piled up and it couldn't be disputed. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. All right. Thanks, Marilyn. Yeah. You're welcome. Okay, let's move on. Against the excesses of the revolution. The French Revolution was immediately combated by the other nations of Europe, which under the guidance of Pitt, Prime Minister of England, sustained a deadly struggle against it for many years. In spite of the guarantees of the, that the Constitution of 1791 offered the King, the National Convention ordered his death by, by guillotine. He was executed on January 21st, 1793, on today's place de, de la Concorde. In vain did Louis XVI try to justify his innocence to the people of Paris before the executioner decapitated him. The sincerest words flowed from his lips as he begged for the attention of his subjects in a wave of tears and sentiments that was simmering in his soul despite his apparent calm. Orders were given to the scaffold, guards, and the drum roll drowned out his words. France drew to itself the most glorious collective trials in that torrent of madness. Under the influence of the English, the first European coalition was organized against a noble country. But repertorial measures were not being taken only in the administrative offices of Europe. The spirit of Lat Latinism also gathered in the spirit world under the blessing of Jesus to employ his protection and mercy for the great wayward nation. Consequently, 
the courageous and remarkable daughter of the Domery, returned to her old homeland at the head of huge hosts of consoling spirits, comforting afflicted souls and blazing new pathways. Numerous ranks of tormented spirits outside their physical prison were led by her to the Americas for regenerative reincarnations of peace and liberty. Okay. So here, um, a little bit of the influence and the, the activity of the spirit world and the events that happen in France, right? So, but first, uh, we talked a little bit about the, the other nations in Europe. Uh, the prime minister in England was Mr. Pitt that uh, kept fighting against France and against the revolutionaries for many, many years. Um, of course, um, you know, there is, there is no war without two sides wanting to fight. So the French, uh, the government in France saw the benefits of the war also. They had some, you know, some use for the war in terms of uh, a lot of, uh, because what, what you do with the war against a foreign enemy is that you deviate the attention of the people from your own problems, right? So everything that is happening inside France, an easy way to unite uh, the, the, the population in support of the government is to find an external enemy. That's something that is was always used and is still used up to today, right? Whenever you have a, a foreign threat, you unite the people in support of the government. And that's what uh, that was what uh, the French uh, government, the different governments, because from 1789 to, to, to up to when Napoleon took power at around 1800, uh, there were several different governments, there were several different uh, rulers in France, and, uh, but all of them always using war to, as a, an escape to unite the population. It worked, uh, sometimes it didn't work. Anytime. So uh, Lafayette, for instance, he lost his position in the government because the National Guard uh, attacked a, a crowd that, uh, that uh, reunited asking for the abdication of, of the king. And uh, in the end, uh, in, in the end, they fired against the crowds and they killed um, around 20 to 50 people and, uh, and the reputation of Lafayette was pretty damaged. And, um, and in the end, he was, uh, he was a step, uh, he was cast aside by the book. So the King um, Louis XVI, he was, he was living in the, in the Palace de Tuileries uh, under vir virtual house arrest. And he was told to, that he had to, by his brother and his wife, Marie Antoinette, that he had to reassert his independence and had to move to another place. So he tried to move to Mont Medi with 10,000 soldiers that were considered loyal to the crown. And he was arrested. He was uh, in this, living in the palace in disguise, but he was arrested when he was going through Varennes. And uh, he was taken back to Paris, and that uh, the, the, uh, the, how the story was sold that he was trying to escape to Austria, and he was going to Austria to gather uh, an invasion of France and to take back the power. That was the story that was sold to the population, and that was the justification for uh, the, the the monarchy to be to be. Uh, overthrown and for him to be decapitated. They had the guillotine at the time. So he was decapitated in, uh, in January 21, 1793. Uh, with, you know, the decapitations were public, uh, public spectacles saw, watched by many, many people. And uh, the, the, the one who had, was going to be decapitated could speak words before being decapitated. And of course, uh, Louis XVI, in the end, he was, he was a victim of all of this. He was a, a weak king 
that inherited a huge problem and didn't know how to to solve the problem. He didn't, didn't have many resources, uh, intellectual and political resources to deal with all the situation. Ended up paying for it uh, with his life. His wife, Marie Antoinette, there is several stories about her. She was also born in, the, in royalty in Austria and uh, didn't have any idea of, uh, of the problems of the population. And uh, she was very young when she got married and uh, ended up paying the price also for her lack of, uh, of understanding of the realities. But um, when uh, they talk here about the collective trials, the Dolores collective trials in this madness, of course, every time you, you create these barbaries, you create uh, consequences. So all the spirits that were responsible for this bloodbath during the French Revolution that deviated from the right path were, um, you know, have to, to readjust in future incarnations. But the victims or those that were uh, deceived by the, the rulers and ended up participating in this, creating uh, um, consequences, minor consequences for themselves, that's what their spirits are talking here. Uh, Emmanuel is talking here by the, in, in the end. The, the spirits of Latinism gather in the spirit world under the blessing of Jesus, uh, asking for the protection of the country. And the daughter of Dom Remy is Joan of Joan d'Arc, that uh, Joan of Arc, that returned as a spirit to her old homeland uh, with, a, with a, a number of spirits that uh, to help and assist France into these difficult times because the spiritual protection and the spirit of, spiritual guidance is never, uh, it's never lacking. It's always there. Of course, we have our free will and uh, we see the consequences, but uh, it's interesting when he says here that numerous ranks of tormented spirits outside their physical prison were led by her to the Americas for regenerative reincarnations of peace and liberty. So it is sad, and uh, actually Francisco Xavier talks about this, uh, talked about this, that uh, around 2 million souls uh, immigrated from France to the Americas, um, especially many of them at the, at the times of, of spiritism, which is a little bit later to Brazil, but uh, at this time of the revolution to all of America's here in the US, we have many uh, French that were reincarnated and that brought the, the notions of uh, liberty, uh, freedom, fraternity, and equality that uh, is the basis of, uh, uh, of the constitution of this country and uh, what this country has been trying to do, of course. Uh, not working uh, complete, not getting it right all the times, but that's the idea. So we had a lot of these uh, spirits that uh, struggled in the revolution, reincarnated in the Americas, and uh, to to continue the work uh, assigned by the spirit world for for them to to start new paths, to to face the consequences, and to build new uh, new opportunities. Okay. Comments, questions here? Okay. So the reign of terror. Okay. That's the, the difficult part of it. Yeah. Luis, you have something? No, I, I don't know if it's obvious for everybody, but uh, uh, the daughter uh, why Joan of Arc is the daughter of Don Remy? Don, Don Remy is uh, actually a small town in France where she was born. Yeah. And I'm sure many people who, who read this part doesn't understand that he means Joanna d'Arc, but you, you translated that. Yeah. And if I might, a, a second thing, it, it's difficult for us to understand what was... Uh, uh, the monarchy in Europe at that time, uh, uh, they were sort of a class apart beyond nationality. 
they intermarried. Uh, uh, Marie Antoinette was Austrian, and they intermarried. The courts of all countries mostly spoke French, and you know they were like a, a, a clan where each one had his you know part that he exploited. So when this happened in France, uh, uh, the monarchy as a whole was was very impacted. They were uh, uh, under attack. So it was, it was not a nationality thing. It was a strongly a, a, a class a class thing. And that's why all the other monarchs gathered together in a front against France. And this is very difficult for him to understand today, I believe. Anyway. Yeah, yeah. you were talking about that and I was thinking about the, you know, the recently deceased uh, uh, husband of uh, the Queen of England, right? Uh, which, you know, he was born in Corfu in Greece and he was, his family was from the royal family in the Netherlands and Greece. Uh, so in a, in a small way, we still have that, right? <laughs> Of course, now not even now. You know they are marrying outside the nobility there, but uh, it's uh, I, until very recently you still have that. Yes, Carol. Is that where the terminology "blue blood" blue bloods comes from? Like the uh, the hierarchy of the monarchs, they took on that term. Yes, blue, uh, exactly that. I thought, yeah. I blue, thought bloods. blue bloods. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. Kind of I don't, I don't know exactly why it's called Blue Bloods, but exactly that either. is the, yeah, it's the monarchy, it's the, the <laughs> right. royalties. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's still yeah. used today, right? The Blue Bloods. I, I believe so, yeah, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Johnny, if oh, I might. Yes. Uh, so sorry, just I... a question. Uh, let's check on someone has a question here. Yeah. Who is who? Uh, thank you, uh, this is Sue. Um, you guys know a lot more about history than I do, um, but I I didn't want to pass by this particular section without asking more about who Joan of Arc actually was and what she actually did. I'm very curious, and she sounds like a woman who was a, a warrior. Um, the other question I had, I just didn't get it down um, when Marilee and John were talking. Um, what was the book or the books or the name of the soldier, the story of his? Reincarnation, so Marilyn, I could find please. those books. Yes, Marilyn, can you repeat? Uh, you are on mute, Marilyn. Marilyn, you are on mute. Marilyn, you are on mute. <laughs> <laughs> okay, sorry. Um, it's called Soul Survivor, S-O-U-L. It's the oh, well, that's right. It's the reincarnation of World War II fighter pilot written by his parents, Bruce and Andrea Leninger. And I go to, I, I read a lot. So I um, don't like to pay for new books because that's very expensive. That's why I go to um, thrift books and eBay because I think I bought this book for under $5 and it's hardcover. You can buy it even cheaper if you want paperback. So there you Thank go. You, Marilyn. You're welcome. You got the name, Sue, everything, okay? I did, I got it all. Thank you. Okay, so John of Arc, she was, uh, uh, we studied, uh, uh, talked about her in a previous study of, uh, of this book. She, you find her in this book earlier. She was a revolutionary uh, a warrior in France. Um, it Don't is, uh, according to Don't Spiritism, me. she's the, she's the, the reincarnation of uh, Judas, you know, the apostle, one of the apostles, uh, uh, the one that betrayed Jesus. She's the reincarnation yeah. of, of him. And, um, and she was a fighter and she was responsible for uh, the, the independence of France in the, in the war a hundred years or if I'm not mistaken by, uh, by uh, from, the, the, from Britain. And this was, I'm not sure, I don't remember exactly. What year was I think 1200 or 1300. Um, if you want to read a spiritist uh, version of John, John, uh, John of Arc, uh, Leon Denis wrote a very beautiful book about her. Yes. And you, 
you can find it uh, probably in the internet if you look for it. I think on our, we used to have on our website, but I don't think we have it anymore. But uh, there is a book by Leon Denis, and it was translated into English by uh, Arthur Conan Doyle, if I'm not mistaken, or someone I think was Arthur Conan Doyle, but I'm not sure. So the, the original translation is a very good one. That's why we uh, uh, it was never retranslated because uh, the original translation is good. But it's out of print, of course, and it's not easy to find. But it's a very interesting book uh, uh, by Leon Denis uh, on Joan of, Joan, Joan of Arc. Jean d'Arc in French. Okay. Uh, Luis, you had something else to say. Yeah, I keep interrupting you, but anyway, uh, something that's not obvious, an important force at the time uh, was the printing press. The, uh, a lot of ideas during the French Revolution, they were spread by newspapers. That's not what we think about a newspaper today, but by leaflets. And, and and things that would you know go from hand to hand and people in their own languages in France and people would read and understand and spread the language and exchange ideas and form an opinion uh, and all this came from Gutenberg who invented the press not only to print the Bible but to spread the ideas and as a, as far as I know Gutenberg was a very uh, uh, illuminated spirit a very developed spirit, definitely inspired when he did that. So maybe he was, maybe, no, I'm pretty sure he was part uh, of this plan of the higher spirits to try to guide humanity to a better path. What do you think, Zhuo? Um Yes, I'm sure he was, and it, it, exactly that. They, that's at that from that time you have what's so called the communes, right? In in France, that uh, were a group of people that would discuss matters, discuss political matters. Would would re, uh, uh, you have to remember? Not many people from the 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 poor people was able to read and write at that time. So you had someone reading for them, and then the discussions like we're doing here. Imagine if uh, if none of you know knew how to how to read, then Soraida will read to us, and then we will all discuss. We don't know how to read. We will all discuss the ideas behind what she's reading. That's how it was done at that time, right? And guys, can, can't you see a certain parallel from that to what we are doing now with these video meetings, where we discuss ideas, you know? all over the world and we developed our knowledge and we learn and we we build our model of the world of the world and the universe i can see a parallel of that were we inspired to do this Ro? uh well definitely there is a there is a, you know a continuation of what we were doing in different forms right uh, it's just uh, we are using technology to to, to spread the word in in more in a more ample way, right? Which I believe is one of the benefits of all this technology that uh, that is bringing to us, and all these trials of the pandemic is uh, bringing to us is the ability to connect for, from uh, you know for many to many different places at the same time, and have give the opportunity of many more people to be able to participate and discuss. Yes. All right, the reign of terror. Uh, we're so positive the discussions here. We don't want to go to the dark side, but we have to go through it. Let's go quickly through it. Okay. The reign of terror. The law of compensation is one of the greatest, most living realities in the universe. Under its wise and just determinations, the city of Paris would have to be the state of tragic events for quite some time yet. Thus, the most sinister spectacles of the sca scaffold took place after the heinous revolutionary tribunal and the so-called committee of the public safety were implemented. France's conscience became enveloped in heavy darkness. The tyranny of Rose Perry 
ordered the slaughter of many Conrads and many honest and worthy individuals. Charlotte Corday wrongfully yielded to crime at Mara's residence with the purpose of restoring liberty to the people of her country, expiating her extreme act with her own life. There were times when more than 20 people per day were led to the scaffold, but it was not long before Roseberry himself and his henchmen climbed its steps due to the reaction of the nameless suffering masses. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit, I'm going to talk a little bit about the reign of terror according to histo historians, uh, because I, I think that, uh, you know, we don't have much to say about the spiritual side of it. Uh, of course, in the spiritual world, uh, the spirits were, uh, trying very hard to prevent all this, but it was a dark time of, of uh, uh, assassinations and, uh, and you, know, I'm, 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 you know, I'm going to just go over here very quickly why it happened. It began as a way to harness revolution fervor, but quickly did, did generated into settlement of personal grievances. So people accusing their neighbors and the neighbors being killed because uh, the neighbors didn't like them. So, uh, the convention set price, price control over, over a wide range of goods and for whoever uh, infringed on price controls, the death penalty was imposed. So revolutionary groups were established to enforce them. Uh, the law of suspects ordered the arrest of suspected enemies of freedom. Uh, sounds familiar, right? Initiating what became known as the terror. Uh, from September 1793 to July 1794, meaning less than one year, almost 20,000 people were executed on charges of counter-revolutionary activity. And another 40,000 may have been summar summarily executed or died awaiting trial. So fixed price is that for hoarders or profiteers and confiscation of grain stocks by groups of armed workers meant that, you know, uh, what happened? Food shortages. However, uh, French was uh, struggling with uh, public debt. So what they, the solution for that was to, uh, to find wars to fight. So of course this came uh, back and forth at the height uh, of the terror, any hint of counter-revolutionary thought uh, would cause one to be killed. Robespierre was the leader of, of this. And uh, there was, of course, uh, resistance. Uh, Maha was also one of the leaders. Charlotte Corday was the one that uh, was a young girl, 24 years old, that killed Maha. Uh, because she thought that by killing him, he would end the terror. And uh, in the end, of course, he didn't. She was also executed. Um, Danton, or another very famous uh, uh, person of that time, was also executed. And in the end, even Robespierre himself, the leader of, the, uh, of this uh, terror, was executed himself and his henchmen and uh, the reign of terror ended up a bloodbath that caused the death of many and, uh, and ended up ended with, uh, with, the, with the killing of, of the leaders of this terror. Uh, and uh, you see this name Robespierre as, as the main responsible for all these disastrous times of the French Revolution that caused the death of so many. Okay. How much to say about the spiritual side of it? Because what can you say? Right? It's always uh, we see this happening uh, many, many times before and after that, when the the and the revolutions get out of control and the barbaric acts, um, you know, people without uh, any uh, respect or uh, or of following uh, leaders and on their personal convictions. Uh, cause this act of terror to happen. And you saw that, uh, for instance, in, uh, in Rwanda, not very far from, from now today, right? Uh, in, uh, uh, you know, like 30, 40 years ago, I don't know exactly, 
is exactly the same, barbaric taking over and uh, running out of control. The government that started imposing it loses control of it and it ends up in a bloodbath and in the end only uh, when all the, the leaders are killed and that a change comes if that's possible to control. Sometimes only control by external forces, which was not the case of France, but uh, it's unfortunate. <clears throat> um, um, Stu, yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I have a question about how spiritists um, sees the spirit world in a situation like this. Um, I feel like there are mysteries that I'll never know the true answer to um, in this lifetime, probably not for hundreds of lifetimes, but in, um, in the Roman Catholic Church, in A Course of Miracles, in the New Age movement in America, and in the Sedona Journal of Emergence, there's this sense that you know, not only are benevolent beings helping us from the other side and trying to help planet Earth evolve into a kinder, gentler place, um, that there's a whole system of malevolent beings who are doing the opposite. So, uh, you know, when, it, when we read this passage, that's what I'm thinking of in the spirit world, that it's not just humans up to their um, darkness, that there's a whole system of darkness that's in the spirit world that's promoting humans to act in dark ways. Is there any sense yes. of that system in spiritism or that's just not yes. even a part of the spiritual no, idea? Absolutely, absolutely. You have, the, you have the, the spiritual gangs, as if we can call it uh, so, uh, in the spiritual world. And actually the Book of Liberation that we just started studying um, last, uh, a couple of weeks ago, we're, we're going to, 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 to see a lot of this the leaders of the lower zones and uh, how they try to, to uh, they have their own, uh, uh, their, their own armies of spirits that are uh, only trying to cause us harm and trying to cause us uh, pain. And uh, so every time you see uh, this, uh, this horror, this terror movements, you, you have a, uh, uh, the participation of inferior spirits that are interested in the chaos and interested in the in the destruction because that's that's how they feel comfortable with their own uh, imperfections and their own imbalances. So a lot of the spirits in the lower zones, there are you know spirits that were acting doing this here. They go back to the spiritual world with that same thoughts and the same anger and the same desire of vengeance and then continue work, working in the spiritual world. But of course, on the other side, you have the protecting spirits that are always working and always trying to, to prevent this from happening. But uh, one basic thing that we have is free will. So the, the, the spirits, who never, they are not going to interfere with our free will, the evolved, evolved spirits, because we have to go through our own learning, our own experiences. Uh, the, the, the important concept that we have to, to remember when we're studying these uh, horror uh, situations is we are eternal souls. This one incarnation is just a small page in our long book of lives. So whatever happens in one incarnation, if we are if we kill or we are killed in these horror situations, of course, at the moment that it's happening, it's tragic and it's it's not um, it's not to be forgiven. Or but uh, we have to understand that it's all part of the evolution of humanity and the evolution of the planet. That it has to go through some difficult times, uh, even uh, sometimes to separate the the you know the 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 good ones from the ones that uh, can no longer uh, reincarnate in this planet and have to, to go to a less evolved planet. And again, if you go back to the beginning of this book, On the Way to the Light, you see the, uh, the incarnations of the Egyptians that who came from a different planet, uh, from the, the, the constellation of Capella, which is an immigration of spirits from one place to another that we talked about also. So. Um, Yes, so the, the, the spirit world is heavily involved in everything that is happening here, 
both on the good side and on the bad side, the ones that uh, the inferior spirits try to influence us to cause more destruction and more trouble, and the good spirits trying to help us uh, overcome our inferior tendencies and act for the general good, and sending missionaries all the time, reincarnating here, that, uh, that are going to make, try to make a difference on, uh, on the evolution of this planet. Okay. Yes, thank you. Luis. That was a great question, Sue. Actually, I was going to ask something very similar to that so that John could explain it. But if I might say something, uh, although we know that this happened, we should not think too much about it. I, I usually say in my classes, we should, you know, think good. Actually, this is from a phrase from from a, a, a very uh, uh, likable, important person from Spiritism that passed away last week. Sweetie Caldas Schubert. Sweetie Caldas Schubert. That it's it, it, it's not enough to to refrain from doing bad. We should not think about the bad things. We should learn to think good, to do good all the time, the most that we can, because it's not enough not just to not do bad things. We should not think about bad things too much. We know they are there, but should, we should try to think good because our thoughts reflect on our parent spirit and influence all other spirits around us. Our, our thoughts travel uh, uh, through the universal fluid to other spirits, both incarnated and discarnated. So uh, this is how we can help others. We can influence them to the good positive side. So we should not think too much about bad things. That's, thanks, Luis, and actually, I agree. So that's why I wanted to go quickly through this, but uh, you know, uh, because this is a dark time of the French Revolution, and the French Revolution uh, overall is a very positive thing, right? Despite all the barbarities that happened, and uh, when we talk about, um, we talk many times about this uh, evolved spirits that come to Earth and uh, help humanity to evolve, and sometimes you talk about their personal uh, problems. Uh, and we use, you normally say, you know, the personal problems is for them to deal with the, the, their, their, in their journey, but the benefits that they bring to humanity uh, are what really stays when you talk, for instance, about Einstein, right? The benefit that he brought to humankind is much greater than the small family problems that he had. And, uh, the, you know, we know from his history that he had many personal problems, uh, disputes in family and uh, we, we, we see a, the same thing with Martin Luther King, for instance, you talk about the family, you had, he had personal problems, his wife was not completely happy with him because he was never home, he was always, um, you know, working, and, but this, is, this doesn't, it cannot deviate from the benefits that these spirits brought to humankind, so uh, we look. We have to look at the French Revolution in the same in the same way, right? The benefit that it brought to humanity, the big change that it brought to humanity, um, you know, um, it's much greater than this terror that that uh, happened in the middle of it that caused the losses of many lives that have been, you know, that everything that happens happens for a reason. All those that suffer these crimes. Um, they had to face it one way or another because of their personal karmas. Uh, of course, it didn't have to happen that way. Of course, there are different ways of paying it, but uh, of facing it, but uh, it happened and uh, we, we should take the, the, the bird's eye view of the, of the whole thing as a, as a very positive um, uh, stage of humanity that brought a lot to all of us uh, today and uh, and again, I'm sure some of us were part of this in the French Revolution. We were there one way or another, and uh, 
we we better not remember uh, at the at the at present time what we did there. So, but uh, so I want to just read the next one, and then I, I'm going to to bring uh, a different uh, passage for us to read together. Okay, so Sarai, do you read for us? The Constitu Constitution. After the great struggles during the reign of darkness, the spirits watching over France managed to inspire its public men to write the Constitution of 1795. The legislative powers were entrusted to the Council of 500 and the Council of Elders, with the executive powers entrusted to a directory made up of five members. Thus, a truce ensued which was used to reconstruct noteworthy works of thought, a military fought against the attempted invasion by other European powers whose thrones fell threatened in their stability due to the advent of new ideas of liberalism. And the country's politicians focused on a huge building project attaining the noblest accomplishments with their efforts. However, after its, after its libertine excesses, France was threatened with invasion and dismemberment. There are nations, however, who become predators of the assistance of the higher rims in the fulfillment of their lofty obligations for other collectivities of the planet. Thus, with the attributions of a mis missionary, Napoleon Bonaparte, son of an obscure Corsian family, was called to the heights of power. So, very quickly, after the reign of terror, um, they were, you know, they did the, this constitution in 1795. And, um, and with this constitution, a little bit of peace came, uh, but they were in constant war with the other nations. So they used, again, the, the, the attempted invasion by other European powers to consolidate the notion of uh, nationali nationalism in France. Uh, the politicians focused on the, on the reconstructing the country. Uh, France was threatened with invasions, and uh, the the in uh, on November 9, 1799, uh, it's considered the end of the French Revolution. And when uh, Napoleon Bonaparte uh, took power and uh, became the emperor a little bit later than that. Uh, and with that, it changed uh, from a monarchy to a republic to an, uh, an empire. So as Napoleon becomes the emperor, uh, everything starts, uh, a new phase starts in France. And uh, that's where I am, I'm going to bring something uh, that we can read together that talks about the role, this, the supposed role of Napoleon in, uh, in, in France. And uh, so we can compare to what uh, really happened. So here I'm going to share with you Kardec and Napoleon. This is from this new book that uh, the United States Spiritist Federation uh, just published called Light Ahead that has many passages from, uh, from Francisco Xavier and several spirits. Uh, we, we used some of them in our uh, commemoration of the of the 20th anniversary of SGNY. But uh, on page 41 of this new book, we find this passage from Brother X uh, that Elmo spoke about him in our, uh, on our celebration, right? Explain about Umberto de Campos, Brother X, the poet, the famous poet writer in Brazil, that when he uh, went back to the spiritual world, he started writing um, through Francisco Xavier and this is one very, very interesting message that you find in the book uh, Letters and Chronicles that is still not uh, translated into English. But I'm going to read for you 
uh, because I think uh, it's, it helps us understand uh, what comes next for France and uh, what was the role of Napoleon that he was supposed to, be, to have and uh, what he really has, okay? So soon after that date that I sent, soon after 18 Brumaire, which is November 9, 1799, and after Napoleon had appointed himself first consul of the French Republic, on the night of December 31st, 1799, remember, change of century, the last nine, night of the century and the beginning of the new century, a large assembly of wise and benevolent spirits gathered in the heart of the Latin spiritual quarters in the spiritual superior planes of the spirit world to mark the momentous beginning of the new century. Ancient personalities from Imperial Rome, pontiffs and warriors from Gaul, Gaul is the old France, right? Alan Kardec was, uh, Kardec's name comes from Gaul. And notable figures linked to Spain were assembled there for the expressive event. Legion of Caesars with the banners, phalanxes of Gallic warriors and groups of pioneers from the Hispanic expansion, along with numerous representat representatives from the Americas stood along symbolic lines in positions of prominence. But not only dignitaries of Latin descent were represented at the great conclave, Illustrious Greeks, recalling the confabulations of the glorious Acropolis, renowned Jews, remembering the Temple of Jerusalem, Slavic and Germanic delegations, great figures of England, Chinese wise men, Hindu philosophers, Buddhist theologians, ancient priests of Olympi Olympian deities, renowned clerics of Roman church and followers of Muhammad. It appeared as, the, as humankind's scientific and culture force, cultural forces have been summoned to this one place. This is all happening in the spiritual world, okay? In the midst of the magnific magnificent delegations gathered there in all their representative splendor, the spirits of early supporters of progress emerged. Soon to return to the world of the incarnate, or to follow it closely, to fight ignorance and misery in the laborious preparation of the new era of fraternity and light. Amid the dazzling sight of the superior spirits with the effulgence of their souls were Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, Apollonius of Tiana, Origen, Hippocrates, Augustine, Fenelon, Giordano Bruno, Thomas Aquinas, Louis of France, remember we talked about him in Louis IX. Vincent de Paul, Joan of Arc, Teresa of Avila, Catherine of Siena, Bothwell, Spinoza, Erasmus, Milton, Christopher Columbus, there you go, Louis, Gutenberg, Galileo, Pascal, Swedenborg, Emmanuel Swedenborg, Borg, they wrote Heaven and Hell. Uh, beautiful book, Predecessor to Spiritism, Dante Alighieri, just to mention a few of the heroes and champions of the terrestrial renewal. In a less radiant position in this magnificent place stood spirits of a lower order, including many of the well-known guillotine during the French Revolution, namely Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, Robespierre, Danton, Madame Holland, André Chenier, Bailey, Camille de Moulin, and other great figures, such as Voltaire and Rousseau. Interesting here, spirits of a lower order, less evolved spirits. Okay, and you see the names that we just mentioned here, Robespierre, Louis XVI, Marie Antoinette, Camille de Moulin. After brief remarks from eminent spirit guides, invisible trumpets directed towards the earth were heard. Moments later, from within the thick of the night, shrouding the colossal body of, by, of the European world and under the custody of enlightened spirits emerge a small procession of shadows who seem strange and hesitant with, when confronted with the brilliance of the festive place. It consisted of a group of incarnated souls who constrained by the celestial organization went back to the spiritual realm to reaffirm their commitments. 
I had was Napoleon, drawing the attention of all the assembled. Indeed, he was the typical Corsican, wearing his usual garments and characteristic hat. Greeted by several figures of ancient home, Rome, who hastily offered him their aid and support, the winner of the Battle of Rivoli took seat on a magnificent chair prepared for him beforehand. So Napoleon, for those that don't know, is a was a reincarnation of Julius Caesar, the emperor. That's why they said, they say here, greeted by several figures from ancient Ro Rome, who hastily offered him their aid and support, because they still rever revere him as Julius Caesar. So he came to have another opportunity. Julius Caesar was a very import important uh, emperor uh, the, on, on the Roman Empire. So he was there in a, in a special chair. Amongst those accompanying him in this unique excursion were respectable authorities reincarnated on the planet, such as Beethoven, Ampere, Fulton, Faraday, Goat, John Dalton, Pestalozzi, and Pius VII, along with many other supporters of the prosperity and independence of the world. So all these people here that is mentioned, they are all incarnated. So they are taken to the spiritual world in their, in their sleep. And we know many of those, of course, Beethoven. Pestalozzi was Kardec's teacher. Uh, Kardec learned everything in terms of education with Pestalozzi, who was, was a pioneer in education. Pius seven was the Pope at that time. And, uh, you know, Goethe, the philosopher, Faraday, that uh, was a scientist that, uh, uh, Fulton that invented the, the, the trains, right? The, the machines, um, Ampere, the name says all for the electric city. So all these incarnated at that time were brought also for this special meeting in the spiritual world. Though spiritually constrained by the ties linking them to their carnal bodies, almost of the newly, all of the newly arrived were bathed in tears of emotion and joy. The eyes of the first consul of France, however, were dry in spite of the extreme pallor of his face. Various Roman legions proceeded to pay him homage, to which he responded with discreet nods when the trumpets resounded in a different way as if preparing to soar upward in the direction of the infinite vastness. Immediately after, a pathway of light similar to a drawbridge was projected from the sky and connected itself to the extraordinary citadel, letting through countless resplendent stars. Upon reaching the delicate ground, however, these stars transform into human beings covered in radiant celestial lights. So these are even more evolved spirits coming. Among them all, there was one who excelled in superiority and beauty. You can all guess who he is. A brilliant diadem uh, shine on his head as if surrounding with blessing his gaze. Viewed with tenderness and strength. In his right hand, a gold set, scepter shone in sublime scintillations. Imperceptible musicians, by way of gentle breezes that drifted by swiftly, broke into a chant of hosannas without articulating any words. The assembly showed profound reverence. Many of the wise men, warriors, artists, and thinkers knelt down while the banners of the vexillaries were lowered quietly in a sign of respect. It was then that the great Corsican started to weep, stood up and headed with great difficulty towards the messenger who was holding the gold scepter, kneeling before him. That's what happens when we are in the presence of a very illuminated spirit. And you can imagine how Napoleon will feel in the presence of our master. The celestial emissary, smiling naturally, lifted him up at once, trying to embrace him when the sky seemed to open up before our presence. A voice, energetic yet gentle, strong as the wind and harmonious as the stream of fountain, called out to Napoleon, who seemed exhilarated both by fright and joy. Brother and friend, listen to the truth in which my spirit speaks to you. You stand before the apostle of the faith under, under, which under Christ's shield 
we release a new cycle of knowledge in the tormented earth. Yesterday, Caesar, and today, a guiding leader. Surrender the coat of your adoration to the pontiff of the light. Reaffirm before the gospel your commitment to the aid in its mission of revival. Congregated here are leaders of all epochs, patriots of Rome and Gaul, generals and soldiers who accompanied you in the battles of Pharsalus, Papsus, and Manda, and remnants of the battles of Gergolia and Alesia, surprised you here with sympathy and anticipation. In earlier times, seated on the throne of absolutism, you intended to be a descendant of the gods in order to dominate the earth and annihilate your enemies. Now, however, the Supreme Lord granted you as birthplace an island lost in the sea, so you would not lose the sight of human smallness. He also determined that you return to the midst of the people you once scorned and humiliated in order to ensure their immense mission among humankind in the new century that is about to begin. You see here, Napoleon as Caesar invaded Gall Gallia and dominated the French, the, the, the so-called French as Julius Caesar, right? So people you scorn and humiliate, you are born there. You see the law of reincarnation. We go back to the places that we are supposed to pay our duties. Played by celestial wisdom at the helmsman in order to of order in the sea of blood of the revolution, do not forget the mandate for which you were chosen. Do not believe that the victories you are vested in by the consulate should be attributed exclusively to your military and political genius. The will of the Lord expresses itself in the circumstances of life. Invest yourself with courage to govern without ambition and to rule without, without hatred. Draw on prayer and humility to avoid precipitating yourself down the cliffs of tyranny and violence. Designated to consolidate the peace and security necessary for the success of the mission of the selfless apostle who will unveil the new era, you shall be visited by the dreadful temptations of power. Do not be fascinated by vanity, which will seek to set a crown on your head. Remember that the suffering of the French people inflicted by the calamities of the civil war is the price of the human liberty you shall defend upon to your own sacrifice. Do not degrade yourself by enslaving weak and oppressed populations, nor taint your commitments with exclusiveness of our revenge. So an advice for him not to do exactly what he ended up doing, right? <laughs> Remember, that because of injections of the past, you were reborn to guarantee the spiritual ministry of a disciple of Jesus who returns to the terrestrial plane. Make use of this opportunity to sanctify the sublime principles of goodness and forgiveness, of service and fraternity of the Lamb of God, who hears us in his glorified throne of wisdom and love. If you honor our promises, you will accomplish your mission with the recognition of posterity, and you will climb higher horizons of life. However, if your responsibilities are neglected, grim torments will heap up onto your days, which will become dismal lamentations in a vast desert. In the new century, we will begin preparations for the third millennium of Christianity on Earth. New concepts of freedom will surface for humankind. Science will elevate itself to indef indefinable heights. Cultured nations will forever abandon slavery and the traffic of free people. And religion will release the chains of the mind, which up to now have been locking up the best aspirations of the soul in a hell without mercy. We entrust, therefore, to our valorous spirit the political administration of the impending events. May the Lord bless you. Songs of hope and happiness announced in the heavens, the arrival of the 19th century, and as, as the spirit of truth returned to the heights, followed by several resplendent cohorts, the unforgetful assembly began dissolving. The apostle, who would later become Alan Kardec, holding Napoleon's arm, draw him closer to his heart, and stayed with him 
Garenly until he reconnected him to his carnal body in his own bed. Ooh. On October 3, 1804, the messenger of renewal was reborn in a blessed home in Lyon, whereas the first consul of the French Republic, as soon as he found himself free of the protecting and beneficial influence of Alain Kardec's spirit and his cooperators, who one by one resume confidently and optimistically their journey in a carnal body, adorn himself with a purple robe of power and inebriated by proclaiming himself emperor on May 18, 1804, commanding Pius seven, Pius seven to come to Paris to crown him. Napoleon, nevertheless, after converting celestial concessions into bloody adventures, was hastily relocated by determination from the on high to the healing solitude of Santa Elena, where he awaited death, while Alan Kardec, concealing his own greatness, living as a simple man of the people in the humbleness of a schoolmaster, many times tormented and disappointed, accomplished entirely the divine mission he brought to earth, initiating the Christian spiritist era which gradually will be considered in all quadrants of the earth as the sublime revival of the light for the entire world. Again, from the book, Cartas and Chronicles, Letters and Chronicles from the Spirit Brother X by Francisco Candido Xavier. Okay. 96. So, I think, I thought it was very important to bring this, uh, this text because uh, by on what we are studying and uh, when we are going to talk about Napoleon uh, mm -hmm. more next a little bit more we you know the next two items of the book is first Napoleon and then Alan Kardec so we see here that Alan Kardec was the spirit protecting Napoleon in the beginning of his journey mm -hmm. and as Alan Kardec reincarnated and started his journey uh, as they say here, uh, Napoleon, uh, we all know the path that he took. And, um, and uh, of course, he deviated from his mission completely because the, the, the idea of, it was the unification of Europe in ideas and concepts, not in the unification of Europe under one domination of one country which was what he, what he tried to do. So in the end, of course, he failed. Uh, the spiritual world uh, had the, the, the role also in, uh, in assisting uh, his removal and uh, exile to Santa Elena, where he finished his days, uh, struggling with uh, diseases, very painful uh, end of his life. And he failed in the mission. Uh, I wouldn't say completely because we never fail completely, but he failed in his mission. And on the other hand, as uh, Brother X says here to us, Kardec, humble and uh, tormented and with lots of disappointed, completed his mission. And uh, we, we are still studying Kardec. And Napoleon is just a, a page in history that uh, we, ref we, we study and uh, we re reference about, okay? I hope you enjoy this uh, extra text that uh, I thought it was very important for us to study and to, to learn about this meeting in the spiritual world. And it brings the idea of uh, also Sue answering to your question, right? The participation of the spiritual world in all the events that happen here on earth. You asked about the, you know, the inferior spirits. Uh, I brought you the evolved spirits participation and uh, how they are involved. And, um, you know, and uh, I thought it was interesting that Luis mentioned Gutenberg and he's mentioned there also as, as one of the spirits that is present in this beautiful meeting that, uh, that uh, brought Jesus to, to personally to, to, to the meeting to help us in this uh, passage, okay? All right, any final questions, comments? No?
Okay, so this is in the book Light Ahead, the new book published by the United States Spirits Federation that you can buy through the USSF website. Uh, some of you already bought directly with us, right? And uh, I hope you are enjoying it. It's a beautiful book of various texts. And uh, so um, next Sunday, uh, again, I spoke about how we change the Sundays. Next Sunday, uh, we are going to have our Q&A, which is the fourth Sunday. And then on the fifth Sunday of May, which is May 31st, we're going to have the study the book Liberation, which instead of the first uh, month, uh, Sunday of June, because on the first Sunday of June, we will have the first weekend of June, we'll have the, the Spiritist Symposium, the 15th Spiritist Symposium from 2 to 5.30 p.m., uh, uh, promoted by the United States Spiritist Federation. So we will, as GNY, we will not have its regular 11 a.m. meeting on that Sunday, um, on June 6, because we are going to be all involved with the Spiritist Symposium. And, uh, you know, if I don't want you to be distracted by our regular meeting. I want you all to be part of the symposium, okay? So you can watch the symposium on YouTube, on the United States Spiritist Federation, the same uh, way you watch the, the lectures on Saturday mornings. That's where you can watch the symposium also. And uh, I'll be I'll be in the in the segment Q, Q and A. The Spiritist uh, ask me any question, ask me anything. So you have your questions for the symposium. You can bring, but before you can bring your questions next Sunday. So even if you have questions related to what we studied today, that I think it was very very interesting you can bring them for next uh, sunday also that uh, i almost was not able to be present here today uh, luis thank you for your help and um, i hope you know you enjoy our studies today and uh, we ask carol to do our final prayer sure thank you john thank you luis thank you everyone Infinite creator, divine providence, first cause, we are grateful today to be together for our study on the way to the light, our study about the French Revolution in chapter 22. We are grateful to have a bit more of the historical perspectives involving France, which brought about many big changes for humanity, for all of us. We are grateful to be together today to share in this study, to be inspired, to be more fully enlightened about these topics. We are grateful for the connectivity through Zoom, helping us to create a, a greater unity with our study, to be together and to share as we can today. We give thanks, we are grateful to our spiritual benefactors, the good spirits, our mentors, our helpers, our healers, and those who are serving to help us to bring forth these great qualities through spiritism. May we continue throughout the week with our prayers, with our studies, with our mindfulness, and may we share together the, these great teachings. As Luis said, think good, do good. And also we remind ourselves to use the golden rule, do unto others as you wish others to do unto you. We give thanks to the love, light and peace of Christ coming through us, within us, that we are able to share these things with others through our discernment. We are grateful for all the blessings we have received, for the healings, for the light, for the enlightenment and for the wisdom. May we continue to share with others and may we be grateful for all the blessings that we have received and will continue to receive. We close now and humbly ask for safety and protection as we go forth to family, friends, loved ones, and coworkers. We are always able to receive help as we do our part. We are never alone. There is always a way to receive the grace and goodness through the love and light of Christ. As we close now, we remind ourselves to be beacons of light. Go forth now in peace, so be it.